Steve, come here. Hey guys, this is Steve. And this is me, the narrator. The cat's not with us now because, you see, it's cold here and she's not a palace cat after all. Well, Steve got an hour of the best content for you. Let's recall how smart animals can be. And we'll start with animal superpowers, the ones only animal babies have. These are the Cathartes, carrion feeding birds who have invented a weird and disgusting form of defense. If there's a predator nearby, the Cathartes spit out the contents of their stomachs onto it. They've had this skill since birth and it'll stay with them forever. Unlike the abilities that other animals have, some lose them as they grow up. But what are these unique skills and why only animals' babies have them? Let's figure it out. Just look at this. This duck is literally climbing the wall. That's the craziest Let thing I've ever video. seen. What's going on? I double checked. These are really ducklings and they do climb a vertical wall because they can. Turns out this happens quite often if you're a duck. I'm not sure that nature designed ducklings to be climbers, but it happened anyway. It's all about the structure of their bodies. See for yourself. Little ducklings weigh from 1 to 1.5 ounces. That is just a little. They have tiny but very tenacious claws on their feet. Yes, a cute fluffy duckling can really scratch you till you bleed. Though most often these claws are used for climbing, like special equipment for climbers. The duckling's center of gravity is positioned in such a way they can crawl up on a vertical wall unless it's perfectly smooth. That is, the duckling probably can't climb a column made out of a solid piece of marble, but it can definitely handle brickwork. For additional support, chicks often press their tails against the wall, like woodpeckers. The result is, well, you can see for yourself. No need for a spider bite. Remember, with great power, comes great responsibility. Okay, okay, this is all very cool, and I'd even let the ducklings join the Avengers team. But why are they climbing walls anyway? Shouldn't the ducklings, I don't know, splash around in some pond and look cute? That's right. They also follow their mother everywhere, though she is much more adapted to crossing rough terrain. Where she can jump or even fly, the ducklings can only climb. However, studies show that you don't need mother duck to make ducklings climb. Sometimes they're ready to climb the walls if there's a treat waiting for them above. But what about adult ducks? To be honest, I've never seen them climbing the walls. Does this mean that with age, the birds simply forget they once knew how to do this? Not quite. Even adult ducks have claws on their feet, which can help them climb. For example, a tree. But the ducks are too heavy to do stunts on the Spider-Man level. No number of claws will help when you have such an impressive body? Why should they improve their climbing skills when they can just fly wherever they need? It's faster and you definitely won't fall in the process. An adult duck will probably not be happy if it suddenly falls to the ground. It's much easier for ducklings. Have you seen how they jump off the cliffs? When you're small, you don't have to be scared. Fear is not real. Attention! This only works with ducklings. Although, let's be honest, for kids and adults, the consequences of falling, say from a bicycle, are very different. Perhaps all kids are a little shock resistant, but ducklings also benefit from their small weight. As I said, they're really very light. Also keep in mind, soft feathers, wings, and paws set apart in different directions, so it's not scary to fall from the height of the brick fence. Some ducks even nest in tree holes, and ducklings have no choice but to jump. They're used to it. Ants are the best when it comes to surviving falls from great heights. They are, of course, smaller than ducklings. The idea is the same. When the body falls, at a certain point, the air resistance pushing the object upward becomes equal to the force of gravity pulling the object downward. Then the body reaches its final velocity. And for a human, it might reach roughly 120 miles per hour. You should realize a collision with the ground at such speed does not promise anything good. However, the ant is so light that if you decide to throw it off the top of a skyscraper, its top falling speed will reach about 4 miles per hour. There are people who walk faster. In addition, ants have a durable exoskeleton, so even falling from the Empire State Building won't harm them in any way. The ducklings are not that tough. But they have one more unique ability, which is running on water. Not over long distances, of course, and yet it looks impressive. When threatened, the ducklings turn on the super acceleration mode. They cannot fly away anyway, so they run. And they do it nine times faster than if they were swimming. Adult ducks have the memory of this ability, but they only use it to take off. And now the really important question. 
Why only the babies get any special powers? Don't you think this is a little unfair? Well, even if some adult ducks have been dreaming of conquering Everest all their lives, the ability to climb rocks is still more important for the ducklings. This works for every baby. In childhood, any creature has a much higher risk of dying. The offspring can be protected either by parents or by some special skills. Take people, for example. We are born so weak and helpless, we can die from any little thing. We do not have mechanisms to protect us from predators or fur to protect us from the cold. We don't need them, because other people take care of human babies, providing them with everything they need. Many baby animals also need protection, but nature took care of that. Take at least little penguins. Have you seen what they look like? Yeah, it's as if they were dressed by their mother who was very worried her kids would be cold, so she put her grandfather's old fur coat on them. Though actually, this brown cover is not fur, but very thick, fluffy feathers that help keep warm. When the penguin grows up, its plumage changes to normal, the feathers are tightly fitted to each other, and from the side it reminds more of short hair. But until that happened, yes, we all remember what happens when you can't change your parents' mind. <laughs> But what happens if you take away the unique skills of the animal? I'm not even talking about babies now. Everything is clear when it comes to them. The result is sad, but predictable. What about adults? Actually, there's little difference. A giraffe without a long neck won't be able to reach the leaves from the trees and will lose the chance to fight for the female, which means it will die without leaving offspring. After changing the color of its fur, the polar bear will become noticeable in the midst of snow and ice that is no hunting, no food, and quick death. Without speed, the cheetah will lose the only advantage that helps it get prey and compete with other predators. In the end, well, you get the idea. No future. However, while for some animals, losing their skills means certain death, others calmly part with them when they grow up. Chicks of Hotson, a tropical bird with a funny hairdo, not only have legs and wings, they also have claws on their thumbs. Yes, something like an inheritance from a great-great-grandmother who lived in the days of different pterodactyls. Since Hotson chicks cannot fly but swim well, they jump out of the nest onto the water at the slightest hint of danger. Generally a solid plan, unless you're hunted by a crocodile. When the danger is gone, the chicks need to return to the nest before the mother notices they are wandering around unattended. The claws come in handy here. The Hotsons cling to a tree and climb to the desired height, but as soon as the bird grows up, the claws disappear. Probably not to interfere with the flight. And while we're on the subject of wings, let's take a look at the chickens. Everyone knows that flying is not their strong suit. But it was not always this way. The red jungle fowl, the species from which the domesticated chickens descended about 8,000 years ago, flies excellently over short distances. Not quite like the eagle, but the result is still good. So why did domestic chickens lose this really useful ability? People are to blame for this. We've bred chickens for so long their flying muscles became too large and their body mass too heavy. Well, you know, humanity had clear gastronomic goals in mind. As a result, in order to take off, modern domestic chicken needs larger wings, and evolution is powerless here. But chickens have another ability that people did not take away. The chickens themselves simply do not know about it. Chickens can swim. Yes, if you watch my previous videos, you must remember that almost all animals on the planet have this skill. But only chickens are so shocked by this. What's, what's going on? Am I in the soup? It is heaven. What? And yet chickens can swim. They just prefer not to. You can understand them. They have no membranes on their feet to paddle properly, no water-repellent feathers, and even their body is surprisingly weak. If a chicken spends enough time in the water to get all of its feathers wet, it'll drown, not being able to withstand its own weight. Well, if this does not happen, it can get pneumonia from hypothermia and also die. Yes, my friends, these are the descendants of dinosaurs. Yeah, dinosaurs are capable of much. Steve, what do you say if we change the angle, huh? In the meantime, let's remember about the most protected cubs on our planet. What can a few gallons of water do to your car? Now, it's not hard to imagine how dangerous a waterfall can be, is it? But that's where these birds hide their babies and hide themselves. How'd they come up with it? I honestly have no idea. The great dusky swift lives in rainforests near waterfalls in northern South America. It's probably the only bird that's adapted so well to the powerful jets of water that it's willing to fly through them twice a day. 
Swifts spend all day in the air, and in the evening, one by one, they rush into the waterfall. It looks as if the birds had woodpeckers in their lineage, and sometimes they remember this and begin to bump into hard surfaces. <laughs> Some past researchers didn't even believe that Swift survived a collision with a waterfall, but what looks like an impossible task to some, to others, is simply routine. Swifts are born in nests hidden from everyone by a constant stream of water, and live in them all their lives. No raptor is able to climb that high, and who would risk it? Remember what happened to the car? It's amazing, isn't it? Actually, just so you understand how well protected these birds are, here's a simple example. This is what happens to common nests that are located in tree hollows. If you don't want you and your babies to get eaten, you have to get creative. And the hornbills have done just that. They too lay their eggs in the hollows, but before that happens, the female seals the entrance from the inside with dirt, droppings, or fruit pulp. And she seals it up almost completely so that only a small hole or slit remains, through which the male will feed her. It's simple. No one will climb into your nest if there's nowhere to climb. A few weeks after the chicks hatch, the female destroys the constructed wall, gets out of the hollow, and then reseals it. The chicks leave the hollow as adults, and it's not as easy as it seems at first glance. You may have been thinking, what about all the waste? And yes, indeed, it is a problem. Females of some species of hornbills dump their dirty litter through a hole in the hollow. If you walk by, watch your head. And yet nature hasn't given many animals any way to protect themselves. The armadillo, for example, just got lucky. It curls up in a ball and that's it, no one will eat it. The rest of the animals didn't draw their winning ticket. Just imagine, you have to constantly, almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week, think about how not to die. And some people know how that feels. This is a 1940 recording, and this person is busy testing an ejection seat. Basically, he's trying to survive. It's unclear how strong the next push will be, how his body will react to it, whether he will survive, and how long the experiments will go on. In the future, this invention will save many lives. But few people know that long before humans, something similar was invented by frogs. Look, when a snake attacks a clutch, the tadpoles, wow, that's fast, they're certainly not going to wait to be eaten. Normally, future tree frogs need more time to hatch. But as soon as a predator is near, it activates a special escape protocol. The snake creates vibrations to which the tadpoles respond. And within seconds, all the future frogs are rapidly maturing. They secrete special enzymes, dissolving the sticky shell, and instantly break free. Imagine how surprised the snakes are. Hey, what happened? You wouldn't normally expect a frog row to escape. It's like your oatmeal would suddenly crawl out of your plate and disappear into the unknown. With this defense mechanism, the frog parents don't even need to be around to guard the offspring. They can easily handle everything on their own. But this is not the only species lucky enough to have built-in protection for their offspring. Circapoidea are relatives of cicadas, though few are interested in them as adults. The nymphs are much more interesting. They form a thick foam around themselves as if they spent all their time in the bathtub. They create a defense from their watery urine, mixed with a special sticky liquid to build some sort of nest of bubbles around them. The nymphs have adapted to breathe through the thick layer of foam, but most importantly, it serves as a natural barrier against predators. They say that not only does the foam hide the nymphs from prying eyes, but it also has an unpleasant bitter taste. I don't even want to think that there's a scientist somewhere who's voluntarily licked the insect urine foam, but that seems to be the case. It has kind of a bitter taste. But the question for scientists was, does the nymph breathe through those bubbles? Okay. Some animals did go to great lengths to come up with these ways to protect their babies. But if nature can be called a school of survival, then here, as in any classroom, there must be its A students and losers. This fish is just a role model, a pile of strange garbage is, by the way, a nest in which sickle fish lay their eggs. Amazing level of safety. And there are those underwater to look up to. The big moth hap is a species of fish that can only be found in Lake Malawi in Africa, or in someone's aquarium. But their main characteristic is the belief that the safest place for a baby is in its mother's mouth. Yeah, seriously. As soon as a predator appears on the horizon, all the fry are ready to hide, and nothing embarrasses them. Neither the fact that the mother is in fact a tough predator, nor the looks of other underwater inhabitants. Okay, it was too much with the looks. But imagine a fry who's been hesitant to start an independent life for too long. Ma'am, ma'am. 
Mom! You're 35. Get a job already. Mom! But it's not just the fish that do this. What about crocodiles? They do about the same thing, though not on a regular basis. Females don't hide their babies inside their mouths when danger first appears, but only transport the babies from the place where they were born into the water so that the crocodiles don't become prey to other predators. It's usually not a very long journey, but try to stop this mother from wanting to care. By the way, I've come across information that the female sweeps the territory for any dangers beforehand, but let's be honest, if it happens that way, it doesn't help much. Many baby crocodiles die young despite all the maternal care. They're too desirable prey for adult predators. Maybe that's why mothers try to protect their babies as best they can. They even react to the sound that imitates the babies. If you turn it on, you can scare off a female ready to attack, or make her rush to the eggs thinking the crocodiles have started to hatch. Want more proof that little crocodiles are the most protected babies in the world? They have nannies. The Euro-Asian stone curlews are small birds that are as courageous as honey badgers. They lay their eggs very close to crocodile clutches so they can guard their future offspring together. And don't think that these stone curlews aren't very good defenders. Birds even lunge at big lizards and look like they're about to say, Hey, you're in the wrong neighborhood, buddy! Crocodiles help birds as well and prey on all predators trying to approach their joint nesting places. It is indeed an idol. And it's all watched by the gavials. They would be glad to carry their babies in their mouths, but only fish fit there. And their teeth are too sharp. Well, they have to make something up. They're still better than guinea fowl. Let's be honest, it's much easier to protect your babies when you're a huge predator. But what about small rodents? It may seem strange, but they use similar ways to protect their young. No, they don't carry babies in their mouths and hire babysitters. They just breed in huge numbers. And crocodiles do the same thing. A female Nile crocodile can lay up to 100 eggs at a time, from which many little crocodiles hatch. This is simply necessary to preserve the population when many of them will inevitably die. But there's another way that crocodiles don't know about, and it's probably for the best. Squirrels, like some other small animals, use the shed snake skin to cover their own scent. They literally rub it on themselves and their babies. Hmm, strange. But this squirrel has the same perfume as... Steve. Does the crocodile want to smell like a snake? Well, unless it's the best spring fragrance. Hmm. What happens if I ask Steve to decorate all the Christmas trees? He'll probably freeze to the bones and I'll have to thaw him out. By the way, there are animals that should never be thawed out. And these are... When George Howard, manager of Swamp Park, saw alligator noses sticking out of the frozen lake, he panicked. Losing several animals at once was something terrible. George rushed to the alligators and wanted to pull them out before it was too late. Fortunately, he stopped at the last moment. A quick search on Google and he found out that if he had rescued the animals, they would have died. Alligators are cold-blooded, meaning that the temperature of the environment is very important for them. They can't just hunker down like a sparrow to wait out the cold, so they seek shelter. More often than not, when the weather turns bad, alligators go ashore, bury themselves in the ground or clay, and wait for the weather to improve. But not these guys, they came up with something better. But how do you predict a sudden onset of cold weather? I mean, alligators don't have internet access to check the weather forecast. Besides, even professional meteorologists can't always predict the weather right, but alligators can. They know that in a few days there will be a cold snap, so they stick their noses out of the water and meet the frost face to face. That's because alligators have unique sensors that no other vertebrate has. To find them, all you have to do is look closely at their skin. You see these dots? They sense everything with unbelievable accuracy. Weather forecasters make mistakes in their weather predictions, but alligators are never wrong. Here's your host Steve with the most accurate weather forecast in the world. There's going to be a cold snap all along the east coast of the United States. So I recommend freezing yourself off to survive. And now for the sports. Okay. But why stick your nose out of the water? Maybe it works like an outside thermometer that can tell what the temperature is at any time. Well, not really. In fact, alligators just need air because they don't have gills. So they need to breathe through their noses. <laughs> yes, they can hold their breath, but only for 24 hours. And who wants to end up underwater without oxygen when the surface freezes? But if the alligators were okay, why couldn't George Howard have pulled them out? 
maybe the animals would have been insulted that he was violating their personal space. I was serious when I said that trying to save the alligators would have killed them. It's like trying to move a person who suffered a serious back injury before the ambulance arrives. By the way, don't do that. And even though there's nothing wrong with the alligator's spine, they escape the cold by immersing themselves in the water because it's much warmer. If the animal ends up outside the water at the wrong moment, the combination of frost, wet skin, and cold-bloodedness will instantly kill it. If you have ever swum in bad weather, you know how it works. You get out of the water and immediately freeze. Fortunately, we can dry ourselves with a towel, get dressed, and jump around. Alligators don't have that option. And while you're imagining an alligator wrapped in a towel, let's figure out why the water is warmer after all. There must be some scientific explanation. And indeed there is. The air above the surface heats up faster and moves upward. New masses of cold air take its place. The ground cools down, but unlike the land, water heats up slowly because of its low thermal conductivity and its high heat capacity. That's why water gives up heat very slowly, and by the time winter has come, you can still be underwater. If you're an alligator, of course. As soon as the air temperature drops below 54 degrees Fahrenheit, the alligators enter a dormant state. They temporarily shut down their bodies, sticking their noses out of the water, and wait for things to change for the better. By the way, why doesn't the cold hurt their noses? Anyone who's touched snow with their bare hands knows how quickly your fingers freeze, and here we're talking about a nose. Shouldn't there be at least some way to, I don't know, cover it? Relax. The alligator's nose is just cartilage wrapped in thick skin, and it won't freeze in a short period of time. Yeah, it wouldn't work with humans. If a person spends too much time with their nose out, it'll freeze. And while it's possible to teach the human body to tolerate extreme cold, and maybe train your nose too, the mind just might not be able to take it. Everyone has their own level of mental toughness, and hardly anyone knows this better than David Blaine. The famous magician spent 63 hours, 42 minutes, and 15 seconds in a six-ton block of ice. Battling the cold and fatigue, after only three hours, he decided he wasn't going to make it. At some point, the magician's brain began to malfunction, he couldn't think straight, and he began to hallucinate. Blaine survived, but called the ordeal unbearable. And we're talking about a person who spent a week in a plastic coffin. At the same time, alligators can survive like this in the water, even if the temperature reaches 39 degrees Fahrenheit. And they can spend not just one or two days in such a strange position with their nose towards the sun. Some are able to endure for a week or even more. And then, well, it all depends on the weather. If it gets warmer, the alligator will just thaw out and go back to its usual gator life. But if the cold remains, the water temperature will drop and the animal will simply freeze joining the mammoths. Everything freezes. As I said before, alligators go into dormancy in order to stay alive. It's known as brumation, a hibernation process but for reptiles. Not to be confused with mammalian hibernation. Bears go into a deep sleep, during which they don't eat or drink, and any awakening before that time is extremely stressful for them. Alligators slow their metabolism and heart rate. They don't need food, and all they need to do is breathe. Sometimes they dive underwater to drink some water, but then they stop moving again and just wait. But it can't go on like this for long. Any living organism has its limits. And if the brumation doesn't stop on time, well, you get the idea. But you know, what surprises me the most is not even that alligators know how to go into standby mode, but that they feel warm in cold water. I mean, do you have any idea how cold 39 degrees Fahrenheit is? Probably no human being would last even 24 hours in the water at that temperature. But then I remembered about polar bears. They not only live at extreme temperatures, but even build dens right in the snow where they give birth to cubs. And the little cubs don't die from the cold. Okay, okay, bears are fluffy, so they're warm. What about people who build houses out of snow? The temperature inside an igloo is comfortable enough to live, so it's warm inside the snow? All thanks to the properties of the igloo. The inner layer melts, forming a solid crust. The entrance is deliberately dug below the floor level so as to not lose precious heat. At the same time, the snow provides the necessary ventilation. An ingenious invention that only people who have tamed the cold could have come up with. Hello, Peter. Yeah, yeah, hey, hey, Bill. Uh, what are you doing out here in all this snow? By the way, some scientists even believe that cold can prolong life. Some experiments conducted on rotifers, tiny worm-like creatures, concluded that low temperatures increase their lifespan by 6 to 100 percent. Wait, but why such a big gap? It seems to have something to do with the genes. If you don't have the right DNA, the cold doesn't help. Cold-loving genes. Just like Elsa's DNA, am I right? Enough!
In fact, scientists don't know yet what these genes are and when they appeared, maybe during one of the Ice Ages. And by the way, alligators, or rather their ancestors, managed to survive even those cold snaps. I wouldn't be surprised to know that's when they learned the trick of sticking their noses out from under the ice. Researchers claim that alligators have no idea how to do this life-saving procedure in the water. They just do it. It's written somewhere in their genes. Just do it! Maybe by those ancestors who survived the Ice Age. After all, alligators haven't changed much since then. Seriously, look at any animal and its ancient ancestors. Usually the difference is huge, but not with alligators, because they found the perfect shape. There's simply no need to evolve because it doesn't get any better. Think about it. Alligators have the ability to hold their breath, to survive in the cold, and to trot, or in the case of crocodiles, to gallop. Moreover, they have a long life and impeccable hunting skills. Alligators are real survival machines, and they don't seem to care at all what's going on around them. Dinosaurs? Meteorites? Ice Age? Fire? They simply don't care. Yes, even fire. Alligators simply take shelter in mud pits and thus escape the fire with their entire families. Move aside, Bear Grylls! You know, we've seen a crocodile here, and trust me, he is not going to be alone. This animal knows everything about survival. Even hurricanes don't scare them. Alligators' tough skin works like armor, and their sensors pick up any change in pressure. These predators are ready for anything! I wouldn't be surprised to know they enjoy it. Okay, we're all cold enough already. While Steve is warming up, let's go to Africa to talk about the most unusual way to defeat the enemy. Many eagles, hawks, and other such birds are daytime top predators, with no equal. But at night, the balance of power changes. Wait, what? Yeah, an owl just snatched a buzzard right out of its nest. Wasn't embarrassed at all. Here, let me rewind. It's not a bird, it's some kind of winged ninja. And there are many such cases. During daylight hours, an eagle will gladly dine on an owl or its chick if it catches sight of them. Some species prefer birds as their only meal. But as the sun sets below the horizon, it's owl time. They're real killing machines. They eat everything, including other raptors, reptiles, even skunks. Why not snack on an eagle? Even if the prey is many times larger, it doesn't mean owls won't try. And yeah, don't forget that they fly completely silently. I already talked about this in one of our earlier videos. <laughs> It's impossible to prepare for an attack by someone who acts in the dark and doesn't make a single sound. Hey, what happened? But okay, owls attacking eagles, they're at least, well, in the same weight class. I mean, they're birds, right? Baboons are an entirely different matter. Baboons stealing lion cubs? At first glance, it looks like a cosplay on The Lion King. It only lacks an appropriate song behind the scenes and pride rock. In addition, there's evidence that the female baboon seriously cared for the found lion club as if it were her own cub. She brushed its hair, carried it from tree to tree. Reality is, though, this isn't a cartoon. And Elton John and his songs won't help. Baboons do steal little lions, but they do it not in order to play their hamlet in the middle of the savanna. Everything is much more tragic and simpler at the same time. Lions eat baboons. And it's almost impossible for primates to beat such a predator, so they had to invent a cruel scheme. Baboons steal lion cubs to get rid of the threat in advance. No baby means no adult lion who will eat them for lunch in the future. Yes, wildlife as it is. Generally speaking, stealing is always, well, at least annoying. Imagine going out fishing, setting a trap, then someone just stole your entire catch. What can I say? You're hardly comforted by the fact that it was an octopus that did it, and it's the fourth smartest of all invertebrates. Oh, octopuses are the bane of fishermen. Ocean thieves have long figured out that instead of hunting for all kinds of underwater life, you can just enjoy what other people have already caught. Why bother? There. Everything's ready. Almost a buffet. All that remains is to escape from the crime scene in time. And the octopus has enough intelligence for that, too. Scientists found out a long time ago that they're incredibly smart and cunning creatures. They can open childproof jars, build shelters from improvised materials they can remember and even seriously dislike humans. And eaten crabs? Huh? What can I say? <laughs> Unlike the poor fishermen, Dalmatis spiders know exactly how not to miss their prey. Perhaps that's why they prefer to eat them right on the spot. And that's why spiders eat fish. Seriously, they hunt by wading at the edge of a pond or stream, seeing ripples from fish movements. Spiders literally run on the surface or immediately jump into the water to catch their prey with their strong legs. 
By the way, their span can reach 8 centimeters, enough to cope with small fish. After that, it's everything as usual. A poisonous bite, a short wait, and bon appetit. But it's unlikely you'd take a spider with you on a fishing trip as a helper. Yeah, they look kind of unfriendly. The Alcedo, on the other hand, is another matter. This bright bird, a little bigger than a sparrow, really knows a thing or two about fishing. Usually, Alcedos sit on branches hanging over the water, and when they spot a fish, they instantly drop down. Everything happens so quickly that nobody has time to understand anything, neither the fish nor the observers. But the bird grabs the prey with its long, sharp beak and departs for dinner. They're ideal fishermen, but if the fish isn't good, Alcedos don't mind to add variety to the menu. Dragonflies, larvae, lizards, even crayfish. They'll eat everything that hasn't managed to hide in time. So both spiders and birds are quite good at fishing. You know, there wouldn't be any fish left if they ever learned to live underwater, just like humans. I'm not talking about any future settlements on the seafloor. People are living or practically living underwater right now. The Moken tribes number only two or three thousand on the border of Thailand and Burma. They're nomads, even called sea gypsies. And if anyone knows anything about the sea, it's the Moken. They live by fishing and gathering, hunting on the bottom without any scuba gear. The Mokens can spend several minutes at depths of more than 20 meters. This is just some of their amazing abilities. Hunters from these tribes see better underwater than ordinary people because they've been diving since early childhood. Their eyes are trained to focus even in the middle of salt water. In addition, they're able to make themselves heavier without weights and walk on the bottom. Despite all the benefits of civilization like money, sewage, and Wi-Fi, some of the Moken still leave a nomadic lifestyle, spending most of their time in the sea. Unfortunately, there aren't many of them left. But you know, I wonder if the Moken skills would work outside of the sea they know. For example, yeah, like in a pool. If water nomads are so good at diving, what can they do in the Y40 Deep Joy, the deepest pool in the world? It's just an incredible structure. Basically, it's something like a long, wide tube that goes to a depth of 42.15 meters. The complex has four underwater caves for the training of divers and the underwater glass tunnel for visitors. Here, various experiments and research are constantly conducted as well. But even the creation of this pool is still an experiment. It's believed that it took nine days to fill the Y40 with water and its total capacity is 4,300 cubic meters. Let's get out of the water, pretend we're in a forest, and look up. Notice anything unusual? The trees aren't touching each other. It's as if they're keeping their distance on purpose so that… and why exactly? This phenomenon is called crown shyness. And I'll tell you right off the bat, scientists are still not sure why something like this happens at all. They've been studying shy trees for a hundred years, but haven't come to any consensus. Some think it happens to reduce the spread of pests. You know, if you don't get too close to an infectious one, you don't get infected yourself. Basically, it's just like people. Others say that this is how the branches try to protect each other from breaking in the wind. In addition, some scientists suggest that this way the trees simply are doing their photosynthesis better. They don't cover each other's leaves, which means they let each other make the most of it. In short, no one knows anything. But it's very interesting. After all, plants don't have many ways to avoid anything harmful or dangerous. It's not like they can pretend to be cactuses, for example, to scare away pests. But the lucky one in this regard is the caterpillars. It seems they can pretend to be anything they want. Even a stick. Even a poisonous snake? Really? The butterfly caterpillar, Hermeroplanus treptelemus, gets pretty big. But if you're big and not a lion, you're guaranteed to get eaten. Fortunately, evolution has come up with a terrific disguise. At the slightest danger, the caterpillar dangles from a branch, trying its best to imitate a snake. Sucking air through tiny holes on the surface, it inflates its head, creating the illusion of a triangular skull of a real venomous predator. If the shape of the deadly snake isn't enough to scare away the source of danger, the caterpillar will lunge as if it's about to bite. Although it has no real weapons, and the snake looks like a stump, the whole masquerade works. Now, if the animal world were to award an Oscar, I'd give it to this species. Probably no one goes through such rapid and amazing changes. More often than not, they take a really long time at all, especially when it comes to evolution. However, you can see it in action on butterflies. Let's leave the snake caterpillars alone and travel to mid-19th century Britain. Look, this butterfly is called the peppered moth. It looks pretty boring. But it's the one that had the most amazing metamorphosis. Originally, the wings of this butterfly were white with black spots, and this coloring helped the insects blend in with the bark of the trees. It makes sense. If you're inconspicuous, you won't get eaten. Well, at least not immediately. 
Basically, everything was fine until the Industrial Revolution. Along with it came large-scale air pollution. Ecology greatly affected the vegetation, lichens disappeared, and the butterflies were hiding in them. They had to think of something new quite urgently, for example, to darken. But the story wasn't over there either. More than a hundred years later, people began to fight air pollution, and the lichens gradually returned to the tree trunks. The butterflies sighed heavily and brightened back up. Today, black specimens are still found, but they're incredibly rare, at least until the next ecological problem. While our cat's interrupting the filming process, let's talk about animals that shocked everyone with their brilliance. If your parents are always nagging about the mess in your room, don't show them this video. Because in another Chinese zoo, a chimpanzee, after watching people for a long time, started cleaning its own enclosure. I don't know if it understands the connection between a broom and cleanliness, but scientists believe the intelligence of these primates is about the same as a three or four year old child. So anything's possible. This video was filmed at China's Zhengzhou Zoo, and it looks like the real Planet of the Apes will start from there. A little white-faced capuchin purposely sharpened a rock, then hit the glass with it. Coincidence? No, the animal was frightened, but immediately returned to check what it had accomplished. Maybe a few more blows would have shattered the hardened glass. This capuchin, however, has always been different from his kin. It's the only one who knows how to crack walnuts with things at hand. The other capuchins can't do that. But before the animal has never attempted to channel its monkey genius onto the glass. After what happened, all the capuchin stones were taken away, including the sharpened weapon. The glass was replaced and patrolling was stepped up. Try the sewers, buddy. A family watching lions from the supposed safety of their car at a safari park in South Africa learned that you should always lock your doors, even if you don't think the animals can open it. I know. <laughs> Lock the door. Fortunately, the passengers managed to close the door again and this time lock it. Then you can hear one of them say, Oh my gosh, I didn't know they could do that. Oh my gosh, I didn't know they could do that. Me too, sis. Me too. In one of the previous videos, I told you that a turtle shell is both a reliable protection and a natural trap, which may well cost the animal its life. Rolled over on its back, a large turtle risks not getting up on its feet and could die from heat or because of hungry predators. It's completely defenseless. But there's still a chance for salvation if other turtles suddenly come to the rescue. Usually they don't do anything like that because they turn over their rivals while fighting for the female. Yet if one turtle's in distress, the others know exactly how to help it. Turtles are much smarter than they seem at first glance. If you've ever come across raccoons, then you know they are such crooks. They'll get everywhere they want and steal whatever they want, even things that aren't edible at all. Why? Because raccoons are interested. They'll even steal food right out of a cat's bowl, even when all three owners are around. You know, I think every raccoon is a bit of a honey badger at heart. It's hungry and doesn't care about anything. By the way, mind you, it didn't just steal the food, it washed its paws before it did it. Hey boy, you're supposed to do that for at least 20 seconds. Every mother knows exactly how to entertain her baby, even if that mom is a goat. In fact, goats are a lot smarter than you think. This one, for example, had no trouble setting up a carousel for the baby. Carousel? Really? Yeah, I guess so. This level of judiciousness is not only surprising, but also a little alarming. What if all animals really do understand a lot more than we think they do? Take a closer look at your cat. What if it has something to hide? Of all the animals in existence today, the easiest to believe is the genius of some chimpanzees. After all, they are our closest relatives. Who, if not them, would show wonders of intelligence and stand up to drone? A 23-year-old chimpanzee, Tushi, from the Dutch Zoo showed a real talent for air defense. She climbed a tree, beckoned a quadcopter that was filming the zoo's inhabitants on video, and shot it down with a stick. Because why is it flying here? Tushi saw that the drone was harmless and inedible and lost interest and left. Meanwhile, the gadget, which cost almost $2,500, was hopelessly ruined. But this didn't seem to upset the zoo representatives. They didn't even seem to be surprised. Everland Resort is an amusement park located in the South Korean city of Yongin. Most people come here for the rides, but Everland also has a zoo and a water park and bears. Bears that just adore tourists. <laughs> No, not like that. Anyway, so far no one's been hurt, but the animals know exactly how to behave in order to get a treat. 
Everything is simple. You stand on your hind legs and behave in a very human way. You can wave or hug your companion. Any improvisation in exchange for a tasty treat is good. Officials said that the bears have learned to ask for food every time they see a bus with people, and apparently they did it without prompting. At first, I thought these crows just didn't understand what was going on. Like, hey, why do I keep moving out? Hey! Then it became clear. The birds are perfectly aware that every time they land on the round roof, look over there, they're deliberately getting as close as possible to the point of no return so they can then roll off with the first snow. And again, to land not on some flat surface, but where they just fell from. But let's be honest, everyone loves slides. A German Shepherd named Linda is known in Izmir, Turkey for her daily visits to the local car wash for relaxing water treatments. The best spa treatments involve giant brushes. Can any man scratch your back that way? Play fetch with a dog? Well, better yet, with a beluga whale. That's yeah. crazy, yeah. In November 2019, these sailors from a research vessel, Gemini Craft, took a ball with them and decided to play with a whale. The crew members threw the ball into the water and the sea animal caught it and brought it back every single time. It's as if it understood the concept of the game. In fact, this behavior, which is a characteristic of a dog, is sometimes found in beluga whales as well. They're curious, playful, and love contact with humans. Two tons of friendliness. And this video was already taken at the Tokyo Zoo, and one of the local orangutans wipes his face with a towel exactly like a human. And not just wipes it, but dips the towel in water, squeezes it, then puts it on his face to refresh himself. That summer was really hot. In my opinion, after all the previous monkey videos, the question of where exactly our ancestors came from is no longer relevant. But I do have one more piece of evidence, and his name is Ambam. Ambam can walk on his hind legs. Now, okay, to be fair, all gorillas and chimpanzees know how to do this, but they don't usually do bipedal walks. For them, it's just uncomfortable from an anatomical standpoint, but not for Ambam. Apparently, his father also walked a lot on two legs, like he lived as a pet for a while. By copying people, he learned to be bipedal pedal, and Ambem, in turn, was simply copying his father's behavior. Or it could just be a weird personality quirk that he inherited genetically. If cats really do have nine lives, then Gizmo was willing to sacrifice one of them to save her people, or maybe she really did lend it to her owner. Ron Perkins, Gizmo's owner, was sleeping peacefully on the couch when the cat suddenly put her paws on the pillow and began meowing, loudly persistently, with no intention of stopping. When Ron opened his eyes, he realized that the house was full of smoke and oven mitt had caught fire. And her head right by my ear just meow. She would not stop. Well, when I opened my eyes, I realized the house was full of smoke. He was able to put out the small fire before it could spread beyond the kitchen, and none of the five occupants of the house were hurt. All thanks to Gizmo. The cat definitely saved my life. So next time someone says that all cats are evil, think of her, a real savior of her people. Dogs are just amazing creatures. Sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're menacing, and sometimes dogs are just fluffy angels guarding their owners. The Brousseau family had already gone to bed when their dog Duke, who was adopted from a shelter almost six years ago, suddenly jumped on the bed and started shaking uncontrollably. The behavior immediately woke the couple up. Duke had always been an incredibly obedient and calm dog and had never done anything like that. Then the Brousseaus decided to check on their nine-week-old daughter's well-being, and they weren't mistaken. She wasn't breathing. The parents immediately called the ambulance, and soon paramedics revived her. If it hadn't been for Duke, this story probably would have ended tragically. Many people love birds, but they very rarely reciprocate. But one girl from Seattle is luckier than others. She feeds crows in her garden, and they bring her gifts in return. Metal, plastic, buttons. A lot of things. Gabby Mann's friendship with birds began with the girl's habit of sharing her school lunch. Her parents didn't mind, and soon Gabby started feeding the crows every day. Every morning, she changes the water in the bird bath outside her house and puts peanuts into the feeders. Gabby also throws handfuls of dog food into the grass. As she works, the crows gather on the telephone wires and loudly greet their feeder. In exchange for food, the birds bring shiny trinkets, earrings, a metal loop, a smooth stone. Sometimes, however, the gifts turn out to be quite different. Crows can leave a rusty bolt, a half-decayed claw of a crab, a paperclip, a button, and once they even brought a cover from a camera lens which Gabby's mother had lost. Not only did they get it back, they also took the time to rinse the cover in water. That's because crows, like many other animals, are constantly watching us and adopting certain habits. Take a closer look and you'll notice it too. Steve, listen, we need another transition here.
Okay, this'll do. You know how it goes. If you get burned by the iron once, for the rest of your life, you'll remember it's better not to touch this surface, because it hurts. So honey badgers are something like the irons of the animal world. Well, you probably know what they're capable of and saw videos where honey badgers take on literally everyone. I wouldn't be surprised if one day they attacked a tank and bit it because this tank was making too much noise. But not only people have long been aware of what honey badgers can do, nobody wants to mess with them as these guys are too tough. Cheetahs know this just as well as others, so they learn to pretend to be honey badgers. Seriously, if you look closely at cheetah cubs, you'll see their color is not quite normal. Very light above, very dark below. Does it remind you of anything? What could be a better disguise than a costume of an animal everyone is scared of? No one will dare attack your cub if it looks like a honey badger. Please don't let it be a honey badger. Please don't let it be a honey badger. Let it be a cheetah cub or a snake, just not a honey badger. Not like the last time. Pretending to be a honey badger helps even against lions, who generally don't consider cheetahs as food. Wait, why do they hunt them then? Well, let's just say lions know how to plan their future. Together with cheetahs, they occupy the same ecological niche, which means they compete for food. If there are fewer cheetahs, the lions will get all the antelopes. But the lions can't take on an adult cheetah, it'll simply run away from them. So they need to fix the problem before it appears and get the cubs. But not these ones. These animals look like honey badgers. So it's better not to mess with them. Why are there adult cheetahs nearby, though? Okay, let's not judge the lions. It's really easy to confuse little cheetahs with honey badgers, especially from a distance and without paying attention to the details. No one cares that they not only belong to different species, but aren't even related. When it comes to this level of mimicry, such differences become negligible. Take as an example the fact that an adult honey badger reaches 20 inches in length and cheetahs reach roughly the same size when they are about 4 months old. As for the fact that they have completely different tails, hey lion, what do you think about this? Well, that's what I thought. What about the honey badgers? I mean, they should have noticed that cheetah cubs cosplay them regularly without any Comic-Con. Honestly, I didn't find any scientific data, research, or even eyewitness accounts, even though there are eyewitnesses who saw honey badgers attacking males and biting off, well, their most precious body part. But I think that the honey badgers themselves can fall for this disguise until they come closer and sniff. Oh, Steve, hello. Let's go fight everyone. <laughs> This one doesn't smell like Steve. <laughs> honey badgers actually have quite a keen sense of smell. They find all their prey precisely because of it. But their taste preferences, well, let's just say they're quite specific. And I don't even mean honey badgers love for venomous snakes, which they eat just as casually as people eat spaghetti. After all, we all have a passion for a certain food that no one else shares. Tomato juice, blue cheese, pickled herring. But honey badgers eat everything including insects, amphibians, birds, their eggs, mammals of different sizes, fruits, berries, roots, maybe mushrooms and trees too. Who knows? They swallow the prey whole, including skin, fur, feathers, meat, and bones. Well, when it comes to large prey, honey badgers usually attack sheep and goats, not cheetahs, but who would say anything if a honey badger decided to change his diet a bit? I wouldn't risk it. They say that sometimes honey badgers even ravage human cemeteries. I'd not be surprised if honey badgers turn out to be an inspiration for ghouls and other monsters made up by people. It doesn't matter whether honey badgers usually hunt cheetahs or not. I'm not even sure the honey badger fights only those animals he's about to eat, because sometimes his opponents are way too big. In Etosha National Park, a honey badger who attacked an antelope at a watering hole was captured on camera. He just walked up and attacked. I don't know, maybe the antelope stomped loudly while the honey badger was sleeping? Gave him a bad look or something like that? The idea to fight a creature that is 10 times your size doesn't seem very good. Just take a look at these horns. But the honey badger, tossed 20 feet up into the air by the antelope, was not hurt at all. All he did when he landed is got up, shook off, then charged into battle again. But honey badgers aren't only aggressive and tough. They also have incredibly thick skin. It's quite elastic. Plus, it's difficult to bite through it no matter who tries it. A snake, a dog, or a lion. Hell, a honey badger's skin can take a few machete blows. Don't forget about invulnerability to arrows and spears, and it becomes clear why the honey badgers are so brave. Why should they be afraid with skills like that? Seems like the only way to deal with them is to shoot them in the head with a gun, if you're lucky enough.
Is this the best you can do? Well, who would get into a fight with such an animal? It's pointless. It's enough to check the approximate statistics of fights and defeats to realize why the cheetahs choose this disguise. See for yourself. The honey badger can easily beat the wolverine, perhaps even the one played by Hugh Jackman. He'll survive the fight with a leopard, defeat the harpy eagle, he'll even survive a fight with a wolf. Only a crocodile can prevail over the honey badger, and that, I think, is only thanks to the force of its bite. Okay, it's clear now, no more questions when it comes to honey badgers. But why do cheetahs need disguise anyway? That is, it's clear when we talk about adults, they hunt, and during the hunt, you need to remain stealthy. That's why you need the camouflage color of fur. What about the cubs? Well, they don't have much of a chance to survive. Only about 17% of newborn cheetahs survive to adolescence. While the mother is hunting, little cheetahs have to hide in the tall grass, otherwise they'll become easy prey for, well, actually for anyone. This might have been an issue for a long time until there was a glitch in evolution and the first cheetah of an unusual color was born. I wonder how many variants of random mutation did nature go through before coming to this? Were there any brighter colors? Well, you must admit, such hair is just perfect for camouflage. Light and long on top, it allows you to blend in with the savanna. This area is called the mantle, and you'll never notice it in dried grass. How many cheetahs are there? One? Three? Ten? You never know for sure. Do you see the grass next to the house? Perhaps a couple of cheetahs are hiding there too. You never guess. But what about animals that haven't won their lucky ticket and never got free camouflage from evolution? Suffer and get eaten? Well, for most of the time, yes. If you can't hide from predators, you've lost the evolutionary race. Nothing personal, just natural selection. As a last resort, you can call an alpaca for help. These funny animals know a lot about protecting sheep, for one thing. Remember donkeys that do this job even better than dogs? Alpaca is another option. They hate foxes and drive them away from the herd. Moreover, alpacas understand that predators won't find lambs if they hide these lambs in the grass and stand on guard. Probably they realize they definitely can't pass off the lambs as honey badgers. If you can't disguise yourself as a honey badger, you can always pretend to be a bush. Wait, what? No, sheep don't do that, but deer often wrap grass, branches, and all sorts of ferns around their antlers. Scientists believe that this is a display of strength that should attract females and scare off rivals. Well, you know, not everyone dares to attack this thing. Hi, my name's Steve, and more than anything, I'm scared of the walking bushes. We also have animals that can rival human intelligence. Let's talk about them now. The intelligence of corvids, that is ravens, crows, and their relatives, is really similar to that of a human. Scientists even managed to measure it. Of course, birds didn't have to pass human IQ tests. That'd be weird. A group of New Caledonian crows were tested using special materials. During the test, it turned out that crows have a rough idea how simple physics can help them solve the problem. As a result, it was estimated crows have the same intelligence as a seven-year-old. And this is really impressive, especially for an animal that's not a primate. You know, primates are always ahead here. But when it comes to lab experiments, one can doubt if crows are really that smart. Maybe they were just trained by the scientists to announce the discovery later. Steve, why'd you write that? You can't be so distrustful. <sighs> Whatever the case, all doubts vanish right away if you see what corvids can do in the wild. For example, check out this crow. It's been sitting on a quite common tap because it must be thirsty. Still, it's a bird, and a bird can't possibly… Wait, what? Did the crow just turn the valve? I can't believe it actually opened the tap to drink. It also acts as if that's nothing special. Actually, corvids sometimes act quite weird. But at the same time, they're so ingenious you can hardly wrap your mind around it. What kind of person in their right mind would climb into an anthill and allow ants to run over their body? And that's exactly what birds do. Crows let insects climb their legs and feathers, sometimes allowing dozens of ants to crawl back and forth at the same time. Not because they love being tickled. The main theory is that this ant bath helps the birds get clean and, in particular, get rid of bacteria and other parasites that can live in feathers. Not even suspecting they're working for the crow, ants can simply eat some parasites, and some of the pests will die after exposure to formic acid. Also, all that ant treatment sort of helps soothe the irritation that comes with molting. 100% natural balm for the most sensitive skin. This, in fact, is quite normal in the animal world. Bathing in anthills, or anting, is quite a rare phenomenon, but birds do it for the sake of deep cleaning. You know, when regular bathing and beak aren't enough? Imagine the shock of the first crow that fell into an anthill and suddenly discovered that it felt nice. Alright, let's leave the ants alone. 
After all, Corvids had a lot of time to learn how to use the features of the animal world for their benefit. What about exploiting humans? Well, not the humans themselves yet, only their tools. Honestly, I couldn't even believe what I was seeing. The raven saw a fishing rod left by a man, realized there must be a fish at the other end, and pulled it out. It didn't just grab a rod and start pulling upwards, it clearly understood how the fishing line works. When I showed this video to Steve, I thought he'd be impressed too. But Steve showed me this in return. At first glance, it seems that crows are pecking holes in the ice to drink. Indeed, they often do this when they lose access to water during cold times, nothing weird about it, and it seems like the crow was even chewing snow, when suddenly it pulled out a fish. It made a hole in the ice and somehow guessed the fish would be right below. How? I mean, how? Oh look, the second crow did it too. One, wait, two fish. Come on, is that a pond or a can with food? Actually, it seems like corvids learn to use literally everything that surrounds them for their benefit. Ants, fishing rods, water supply systems, humans, and I'm not talking about begging and not even about stealing snacks from gaping tourists. We'll get back to that a bit later. For now, let's observe the Tower of London. At least six ravens live there, it's believed they guard the crown with their presence, and actually they're one of the symbols of the fortress. So people take good care of them, and the birds understand this. One day, one of the long-lived ravens died. Of course, there was a lot of commotion around this, and another raven noticed this, and also pretended to be dead. His trick was so convincing, the bird keeper believed it, picked up the corpse. At that moment, the raven suddenly came to life, bit the man's finger, and, I quote, croaked huge raven laughs. Tell me, why did he do it? Seems like that was just for fun. Although not all corvids act like that for the sake of fun, these are magpies, other relatives of crows who also play dead. The young magpie lying on the grass simply doesn't want to fly home with the parents. Look, it really doesn't want to. No way. Damn. It looks like they're waking the kid up for school early in the morning. You know when you ask for another five minutes and they pull you by the leg right at that moment? What, that only happened to me? Or maybe this young magpie just wanted to put on a show in front of tourists. How did he know there were tourists around? In fact, it's easy for them because corvids can distinguish between human languages. As we study birds, the birds study us too. In 2020, a study was conducted at Kyo University. Crows in Japan listened to recordings and they immediately reacted more strongly to the ones in unfamiliar languages. But why? Crows can't just have a thirst for the unknown without some goal in mind. These birds have even learned to use tourists for their benefit. Unlike locals, they're more often willing to share food, which means they can be used. You just need to get closer at the right time. But one of the most impressive abilities of corvids, and ravens in particular, is certainly the ability to speak. <laughs> Today it's believed they can pronounce about 10 times fewer words than parrots, but they imitate human speech with great skill. Besides, they perfectly reproduce any other sounds. Although ravens have no teeth, lips, or vocal cords, that is, everything that allows humans to speak, they do have a syrinx, their own vocal organ, and that's enough. Well, scientists seriously doubt ravens understand at least part of what they say, but we're actually dealing with the smartest birds on the planet here. I wouldn't be surprised if they're just gaining experience. Maybe the ravens keep learning to reveal something very important to all of humanity one day. Give me food! Jokes aside, corvids really have a lot of potential when it comes to learning, especially when they're promised peanuts for good performance. Tech expert Josh Klein found out it's quite possible to teach a crow to exchange coins for treats using a special vending machine. Birds quickly recognize the connection between peanuts and coins, understand the coins must be placed in the slot. Just imagine what future this research can promise. As far as I understand, Klein didn't do the experiments with wild crows yet, but if he could train these birds, crows could become, well, valuable members of society, or used to steal change from other people. Just saying. And then I thought, corvids have been around for centuries. They have amazing intellect. How come they've never been caught doing crime? I already explained once why very smart people choose the path of crime. So why should birds be any worse? Or better? Whatever. And you know what? In 2016, in Vancouver, a crow who happened to be at the crime scene stole the criminal's knife. I mean, it just picked up the weapon, the most important piece of evidence, and flew away. The police had to chase it, but the bird, apparently realizing he was being followed, dropped the knife. Why would a crow need a knife in the first place? But the story of stealing the evidence not only drew the attention of people, they also recognized the bird. 
It turned out to be a male American crow nicknamed Canuck, a quite well-known crow in Vancouver. He was raised by a local, so Canuck is not afraid of people, and not only that, sometimes he even acts like a person. Like when he's trying to drink someone's coffee or even taking the subway? Yes. Canuck just got into the train at one of the stations, hopped on the seat during the journey, looked for food, then calmly got off at another station. Indeed. Why fly when you're smart enough to use public transport? Also, when you're smart enough, you realize it's important to stay clean. You don't even have to use ants. The rooks living in the Puy de Fou theme park in France learned to pick up cigarette butts and throw them in the trash. Of course, the birds needed some encouragement. They were given treats. But the fact still stands, they say that the birds were trained not only to make the park cleaner, but also to discourage people from littering. That time when even a rook knows how the trash can works. Ravens, of course, know that too. This video filmed in Haines, Alaska shows a smart raven trying to unlock a weighted trash can. The heavier lids are usually used to keep the trash from being pillaged by animals, but the raven doesn't care at all. It releases the clasp with its leg, fastens its beak under it. Come on, you can do it. Got it. With one clasp removed, all that's left is to remove this last obstacle and… Is that a pizza box? Did you seriously do all this for a pizza box? Okay, okay. Ravens in Alaska are capable of more than that. They pester bald eagles. They steal food from the backs of pickup trucks. Once, several birds even stole 12 eggs out of the car one by one. They just opened the box and took one egg at a time into their nest. When the owner of the car returned, all the eggs were already stolen by the ravens. And then it suddenly dawned on me. In Middle Ages, ravens and even crows were often considered servants of dark forces, harbingers of trouble and stuff like that. What if that was the intelligence that got the poor birds a bad rap? I had to ask Steve for help, but even together we didn't find proof of this theory. But we found something else. The authors of the book, in the company of crows and ravens, John Marsliff and Tony Angel, suggested a very interesting theory. Perhaps the interaction between ancient people and corvids helped us evolve. It sounds a little weird, but just imagine. Our distant ancestors who didn't possess a modern level of intelligence had to constantly protect their prey from smart and voracious birds. Situations like that required actions. So people began to form groups, cooperate, and then, through social connections, they learned to fight dangerous predators. And then they came up with YouTube, Bitcoin, and launched a car into space. Thanks to the birds! If this is at least partially true, then the Corvids pushed us to evolve while falling behind in the evolutionary race. Maybe that's why they like to discuss people so much now. Crows don't just hang out in groups, but they actively share information with each other, spreading something like bird gossip. And I doubt they say nice things about us. For example, if you somehow offend one bird, most likely its friends will find out about it, then friends of these friends, then, well in short you get the idea. The more crows know you're a bad person, the more likely the offended bird decides to take revenge and call for help. Well that's it, you're in trouble now! Now you'll deal with Steve! Steve! Of course, it's a pity scientists haven't figured out how to decipher the language corvids speak. I mean, they can guess some sounds mean joy, some have to do with food, and some are crow curses aimed towards someone's relatives. But we'll hardly be able to find out exactly what these birds think about us in the near future. Though we know for sure ravens use gestures to communicate. For example, they point at objects using their beaks, attracting the attention of their relatives. And this works. I know it may not seem surprising to you, but here's the fact. Of all the animals in the wild, only primates can do something like that. Do you see how unique the ability to just point at something has suddenly become? Well, the new year's coming soon, and we hope it'll be better than the old one. Stay with us. And stay healthy. See you later.